Uh, friends, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, besides my University of Johannesburg hat, I'm also on the board of uh, BDS. Um, I want to start off with a quote by an author that has meant much to me politically and in my personal life. Uh, Viktor Frankl is the uh, father of what is known as the Viennese School of Psychotherapy. Viktor Frankl was a victim of the Nazi Holocaust. Oh no, he writes um, about uh, the Holocaust in really moving terms. And one of the things that he says is, we who lived in concentration camps, and he speaks about himself, I'm sorry, we who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a human being but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And so, when we are confronted with a situation, we always have choices. You are reared in a male-dominated society. You never lose the choice to buy into all the values of male chauvinism and sexism or to opt out of it. You are reared in a Muslim family wherein you are taught that only you are chosen and all else are frozen, you still have the choice to recognize the humanity in everybody who's not a Muslim. You are reared in a Jewish family with the idea that you are a cut above the rest, that God is reduced to a real estate agent who passes out a piece of land to some of his people at the expense of other people, you can walk away from that idea. We are not born with racism. We are not born with sexism. We're not born with chauvinism. We're not born with, with uh, homophobia. We have a choice to walk away from this. Men have a choice to walk away from their privileges over women. White people have a choice to walk away from their privileges over black people. But above all, we need the ability to recognize, to recognize what we are doing to other people, to recognize that it's not only our own hurts that matter, but the hurts of other people. That when we say never again, we actually mean never again to none of the children th that walk this earth. When I was in school, I went to hear Adam Small, who was then a celebrated playwright and a leading figure in the anti-apartheid student uprisings in the early 70s. He was speaking at the University of Cape Town and he was giving a talk on the Holocaust. The crowd was largely Jewish and I'm not quite sure what at that stage, in my high school days already, had moved me to take a very keen interest in the Holocaust and the suffering that the Jews have endured, particularly at that time, but the demonization that they have endured nearly throughout human history. And so, Adam Small spoke on the anniversary of Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht was a pogrom that took place in Nazi Germany on the 9th of November, 1937. On a single night, 91 Jews were murdered and 25 to 30,000 were arrested and deported to concentration camp. I didn't know much about the Holocaust. I simply went at that stage because Adam Small was speaking. Yet I was unable to enjoy his talk, his powerful denunciation of apartheid and racism. There was a palpable discomfort in the audience. I later learned that the audience was largely Jewish, who had come to listen to him to address their particular wounds. 
or those of their parents and grandparents. And many South African Jews, by the way, are, um, are the, the, the children or the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren of people who escaped the Nazi Holocaust and sought refuge in South Africa. For them, Adam Small talking about racism and apartheid, it was talking about the wounds of others. <coughs> blacks in the ghettos, and blacks in the ghettos and in the township, we were seemingly of no consequence to a large part of this audience. Perhaps we were of too much consequence to a large part of this audience because they were privileged whites, and being privileged whites, made them complicit in apartheid. It all became too much for someone who held, what the fuck does this have to do with the Holocaust? The gathering disrupted in chaos, and most of the whites, of course, most of the Jews were also white. Not all whites are Jews, of course, and not all Jews are whites. They stormed out. Now, South Africa, as I said, was a refuge for many survivors of the Holocaust. The Davids of yesterday, were simply unable to realize that within the context of apartheid, they had become the Goliaths. The mantle of David had allowed them to act out their Goliathness, oblivious to the swayings of conscience and the clamor from the victims. When socially constructed groups invest themselves with ahistorical mantles, including the one of victimhood, the end product is invariably injustice towards others. And so, <clears throat> Jews in the world, particularly under Nazi Germany, and before in the Christian empire with the demonization of Jews, and in some Muslim societies, let us not forget that, they <clears throat> have, in yes, they've suffered. But agency for oppression and exploitation must never be transferred to the oppressed. My race, my gender, my religion, my ethnicity, my hair texture, my, my pigmentation, my language, my nose size and my height, it's not responsible for my pain. My tormentors are. And I will only accept responsibility and ownership for my liberation. In the same way that it disdain does not inhere in my being, so too does it not privilege me with a particular virtue. When one imagines oneself as the perpetual carrier of victimhood, then one ends up in the kind of moral morass that is reflected by a giant in, contemporary, in the contemporary Zionist world. Eli Wiesel says, as a Jew, I see my role as a defender of Israel. I defend even her mistakes. Yes, I feel as a Jew who resides outside Israel, I must identify with whatever Israel does, even her heiress. That is the least Jews in the diaspora can do for Israel, is to speak up in praise or keep silent. Friends, if my own brother molests another person, if my own brother beats up his wife, I will step in and fight my brother and oppose him, I will not say blood is thicker than water. The notion of blood is thicker than water is racism. The notion that I owe a moral duty to my brother, when my brother has assumed the mantle of oppression, when my brother has turned into a child molester, and I say, whatever he does, he is my brother. This is the end of any kind of moral of morality. There is no inherent virtue in defending your own flock. All creatures do that. Even animals jump to the defense of other animals. What makes us human is the awareness of the other and the consequences of our choices for the other. The other day I spoke on campus and I spoke about the construction of identity. If I grow up in a patriarchal society, in a viciously patriarchal society, where beating up your wife is the norm, in such a society, I may assume that beating up women is the thing to do. Beating up your woman is the thing to do. I may even assume that it is an expression of my masculinity to give my woman a hiding at the proper time. 
if you, as a male, come to me and tell me that you want your identity to be recognized as a man, I'll say, yes, I will recognize your identity as what kind of man? And so the question of the, the recognition of the Jews to a homeland, the question of the recognition of the state of Israel, I'm not interested in that. Don't come to me and say, recognize me as a man. What lurks underneath it? If you tie your masculinity to machoism, if you tie your masculinity to misogyny, if you tie your masculinity to beating up your wife regularly, I say you can F off with your masculinity. I don't give a shit about recognizing you and your humanity and, and your masculinity. <laughs> so if, if you want to found a state, if you want to found a state that invariably means the disposition of another people because you and your ancestors have signed a contract with your tribal God, who was this land, that land, yes, this landlord or this uh, estate agent, and he signed this contract with you in the Old Testament. And then you come and you want to disinherit a people who've lived in the same land and comrades and friends, sometimes in the same caves that they have lived, that them and their families have lived for centuries. But no, I'm a New Yorker, I'm a South African, uh, I come from Hyde Park in South Africa, or one of the other these things. Um, I've been to Israel once on my birthright tour, and uh, these are the narratives that I've grown up with. And now, I'm an adult now, tired of crime in South Africa, and the black hordes, and so on, uh, knocking at our, in our wherever suburbs where we live. And now I will migrate to Israel. I'll make Aliyah. I'll, be, I'll elevate my status in life and migrate to Israel. I acquire automatic citizenship um, at the dispossession of others. When you build a country and you say that this country is only for this particular people, and I don't care whether you call this country Pakistan or whether you call this country Israel. When you build, when you found a country, and you say this country is only for people of a particular ethnic group, then the invariable consequence of this is that the other groups that are there must continuously be squeezed out. That the space that you make for them, and this gets thrown at us, the space that we make for the, uh, for the Arabs, for the Druzes and so on, all of that space must inherently be marginalized spaces, even though they may parade in the center. It's like, you know, you have um, the little girl sometimes who come and do a performance before the main speaker comes up, and the girls can also say, you know, we were also on the stage. We were also on the stage. So, friends, in my own visit to that part of the world, nine or ten times, I haven't ventured in the last two, three years, I've always been astounded at the apartness of existences. Even as the lives of its inhabitants, the Palestinian Arabs, Christians, Muslims, and atheists, and the Jews, on the other hand, are so inexorably intertwined. It is possible to traverse large sections of this land and never encounter anyone from the other side except perhaps for the Palestinians, regularly encounter with the other as a soldier, a policeman, or a security guard protecting the bulldozers. It is possible to have one shop right next to one belonging to the other, um, with the close kind of proximity that you only find in the Middle East. I know of an Israeli Jew, born of Iraqi parents, and who's lived his entire life in Israel, Yet he first met an ordinary Palestinian at the age of 40. Like the vast majority of other Israeli Jews, he had until then encountered them only in the context of eating in their restaurants or having them clean Israeli streets. He had met this ordinary Palestinian in the course of his business as a head of a large communication company. And they met to discuss the prospects of having satellite TV in Israel. 
Afterwards, he told his brother-in-law how impressed he was by the fact that the Palestinian was well-dressed and he looked like a normal businessman. He did so with a childlike surprise. Separateness has taught him that the Palestinians could not be clean, could not be well-dressed. They could not be able to converse with him in regular business language. It's like black people when they speak English. Oh, uh, where did you learn your English from? You know, uh, where did you... Can, black people aren't supposed to be speaking proper English. That kind of racism. How did this Jewish man not see? How did he choose to not see for 40 years? How do countless tourists come to this land year after year and not see? Are we ever compelled to be blind, to not know? Now, I've traveled there, as I said, on a number of occasions, and I've been a willing participant in this apartness. In some ways, what we see is determined by what we decide to see. Last week, when I spoke to you, I mentioned the analogy of the sex workers in Amsterdam. You go to Amsterdam, it's one of the must-see parts of your visit. You go to, and you have to go and see it. And so you can go to the red light districts. You can take aside this thing, a side swipe also if you want to, and make sure that you have your nice uh, sh uh, stop at the coffee shops, and just make sure that you don't inhale. And if you do inhale, don't tell anybody else that you inhaled, okay? Um, but that's your side stop. Your major distinct is the sex uh, district. And you see these women in the windows. And you see, you see what you want to see. You can see a real sex bomb dressed to, to make you rise or dressed to kill however you want to if you're a male. Uh, that is, you don't generally find women, uh, men uh, in the windows. Or if you're a heterosexual male. <coughs> or you can, okay, this is just business. It's just tourism. Or you can see that behind this is a woman who is exploited, who probably has a passport taken away. You can see the dreadful economic conditions in the country that she comes from. And you can see the pump and the money-making machinery underneath all of this. Or you can just click away as a tourist. And then you say, I've been to Amsterdam, come, you know, and all I got you was this dirty t-shirt from uh, the red light district with my uh, hash bombs uh, on it. And so, as a liberation theologian, I struggle to see the world from the undersides, the dispossess, the darkest skinned people. <clears throat> For a South African, the sense of deja vu, of gosh, I've been there, it is inescapable immediately upon arrival in the land of Palestine and Israel. Let me rephrase that. For a South African who has lived or just survived under apartheid, or a South African who has acted in solidarity with those who did, it's a fairly simple matter to be struck by this enforced separateness. In some ways, all of us are the children of our histories. The relevance of our own stories and sadly, the irrelevance of the stories of others. Yet, we choose to be struck by the stories of others. We choose, and the extent to which we are struck is perhaps the barometer of our humanness. At the time of my first visit, in the mid-80s, there were as yet no sustained call for any boycotts or divestment from Israel. I was, however, aware that I could only justify going there by being very clear that my visit is an act of solidarity. I also understood that by going there, I made a political choice. I come from a country, this country of South Africa, where we called upon the conscience of the world to stay away from us. We were expected all decent people to heed the call for economic, academic, cultural and sports sanctions against South Africa. We called for divestment from our own country, despite the fact that under the apartheid regime, it was a crime of treason to do so. Chief Albert Lutuli, the father of our nation and the Nobel Peace Prize winner, appealed to the world as early as 1960, and I quote, we welcome most heartily the actions of the overseas people in launching this boycott against South Africa. Our hope really is this, that we can bring pressure to bear on South Africa, 
that through this pressure, South Africa will change its way of dealing with black people. We know as African people that we as an oppressed people will never gain our freedom without suffering. But it is a demonstration of the solidarity of the freedom-loving peoples throughout the world. We pursue our policy of nonviolence up to the limit. And we know that that limit was called off by Nelson Mandela, that is today celebrated. I mean, it's hilarious, you know, soldiers putting up these posters of Nelson Mandela, kind of recognizing Mandela as some kind of Father Christmas, everybody's favorite uncle. All these bloody Johnny come latelys, you know. Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela was holy shlashla before he was embraced by all these liberals as Madiba. <laughs> holy shlashla. Holy Shasha was the shit stirrer. Mandela went to jail for 27 years, not because he hosted peace picnics, not because he invited people to have nice dialogue to come and ride a camel. Mandela went to jail because he established a point of Sizwe. Mandela went to jail because he fought, he was a fighter, he was an uprooter, he was a shit stirrer. That is what Mandela went to jail for. This is this is dreadful. This is appalling. The appropriation of this fighter of our nation for racist objectives to affirm a racist state and then coming with a very selective quote here and there about Mandela saying something nice about the state of Israel and so on. No, 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 comrade. Where were you in the 70s? Where were you in the 80s? You had one figure, fine, granted to her, Helen Sussman who represented the Houghton constituency. <laughs> Determined fighter against apartheid, but at the same time, blacks can only get the right to vote if they have a certain economic standard. The whites can only get, blacks can only get the right to vote if they are of a certain educated right level. So liberalism has its own limitations. Liberalism has its own viciousness. But the one thing that we will not allow you to do with all your very, very expensive this year, by the way, the huge the millions of dollars that the Zionist regime has poured into fighting Israeli apartheid weak and BDS. It's fascinating. But you see the fruits of it, the very colorful and expensive posters that you see all over the place these days. And so, friends, it was Albert Lutuli who spoke about this and said that nothing good can flow out of all the efforts directed against defeating a policy which seeks to perpetuate Afrikaner domination and economic exploitation. And so throughout the years of the boycott, we continue to welcome visitors from the United Nations, friendly governments, international solidarity activists. Others less welcome, they also came, like many people go to Israel today. Some of them, surprisingly nice folk, all claiming innocence and being apolitical. We despised them. We hated them. They came at the invitation of white South Africa like you go at the invitation of Zionist Israel. They had the money and the freedom to do with their money as they pleased. Many of these tourists and investors returned to their homes abroad, not surprisingly enchanted with our astonishingly beautiful country what that it had to offer and ignorant of the reality of the faces that smile behind them. You know, uh, many black people, you smile at white people all the time. You have to. Your mother is a domestic worker. Your mother has to uh, say nice things, you know, to them all the time. But we know the reality, the resentment that there is amongst the masses at being forced to smile and to be nice. And so, you take this tourist to Israel on these, uh, on these uh, uh, Zionist supporting junkets and you show them and they Arabs smile at you and some of them also of course paid by you to tell you nice narratives but we've been there, we've done there, we see, we've seen through it. Uh, comrade uh, comrade uh, Rashad is calling on me to, uh, co to uh, call this uh, to a close. So I do want to say, finally comrades, every single veteran of our country's liberation struggle Every single veteran has said that what the Palestinians are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, it is far worse than what we have experienced under apartheid. You may be able to get a right-wing Christian uh, to come and speak here to us. 
And by the way, there's also one or two, I may have said without exception, I'm sorry. Um, I may have said without, I may have said without exception, but there's been one or two. I think recently you had one of them, uh, Terra, Terra Lakota was here. So of course, every damn struggle has its own sellout. We've all had to deal with them. It's no big deal, you know, that you can get your meshwe uh, from somewhere, or your Terra Lakota from somewhere, or you can rope your Udakadali in somewhere. All these has-beens consigned to the dustbin of history, seeking to find some kind of relevance, and at the same time, make a quick buck for themselves by the diem that they get from the Israeli regime. Friends, the only option in front of us that we have as people in solidarity is to act, to compel our government to act against uh, the state of Israel, to boycott, divest, and to take sanctions against Israel, to spread this awareness amongst people, and to make the connections, what is called intersectionality, to make the connections between all forms of suffering and the sufferings of the Palestinians, and to find ways of integrating all of that in our daily struggles. Thank you very much.